Hello, my name is Bruce Hirsch. I'm an infectious disease specialist at Northwell, and I'm talking about clinical climatology and you. Now this is February 23, and outside the weather is kinda crazy. It's in the 60s, later it's going to be very, very cold. This is what our weather in the winter usually looks like. Things are unpredictable right now, and I want to address this. I want to talk about the health impacts, the impacts of our changing climate on all of us. So I'm going to be talking in four parts. Uh, the first, I'm going to talk very briefly about our climate, about our changing climate. Then I want to talk about heat stroke and hyperthermia, when the body gets overheated. I'm going to spend some time talking about general health impacts. And then finally, what do we do now in this time, in this very challenging era? So the changing climate. Now, I don't know about you, but in 2012, Hurricane Sandy invaded our personal space. All of us were impacted by this. Hurricane Sandy was the largest storm uh, during that hurricane season. And I, I don't know if I just had a failure of imagination, the actual experience of being without electricity, of being outside my home, of having to cope with this, all of us were in this together, uh, and we were all coping with it. And it has created in us a sense of being climatologist. Every day we look at the skies, we look at weather apps, we look at the weather report, and we're curious about what's going to happen because we know from our guts, from our experience, that weather can be crazy. Things are really changing. We're becoming climatologists right now. So the, the changing climate dates back hundreds of years to the 18th century in Great Britain. The factory system of production started with the spinning jenny in 1764. All of a sudden, there was a new way of producing uh, clothing and, and, and uh, and processing cotton. And over a period of time, the power loom was developed about 40 years after the spinning jenny. And by, 16, by um, 1850, there were 260 million power loom operators in Great Britain. And this factory system spread throughout the world. And the steady range of carbon dioxide of about 270 parts per million, which had been steady for centuries, began to accelerate in the 20th century. And over the last 60 years, we see this increasing trend of more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And the carbon dioxide impacts our, our climate directly. Carbon dioxide is one of several greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases trap solar energy in our atmosphere and warms the planet. Other greenhouse uh, gases include methane, nitrous oxide, and water vapor. And in a warming world, there's more water vapor in our atmosphere. So solar radiation comes uh, through the atmosphere, it warms our planet, and it dissipates in space. And when there's greater amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, more heat is trapped, and we're experiencing greater temperatures. The temperature has increased over the past years by 1.6 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Earth is running a fever. The warmest year on record is almost always the current year or the most recent year, and it's impacting everything. 
One of the impacts is increasing fires. And this uh, view of, of San Francisco in the dark at 10 a.m. in the morning in September of 2020 is just an example of the occasional shocking and devastating changes in our day-to-day -day lives, in our atmosphere, in the air that we breathe, in the light and the temperature that's all around us. Wildfires are increasing throughout the globe and it's impacting all of us. Our climate is changing and one of the impacts that, uh, that, these, uh, that uh, hot weather impacts on us is increasing our own body temperature. And at an extreme, our body temperature becomes unable to regulate itself and we become vulnerable to heat stroke. And that's a process that's related to the temperature and also to the humidity. Um, uh, we derive something called the heat index. And when the heat index is greater than 130, it's, ext it's extremely dangerous. And one cannot be in that, uh, that uh, setting for a prolonged period of time without serious health impacts. It impacts people who are working outside, who are outside, um, and it becomes uh, very, very dangerous. It impacts productivity. It impacts the ability to process food, to do agriculture, to do construction work. It becomes dangerous for all of us. When the heat index rises over to 160 degrees, it becomes fatal. And these high temperatures, these high so-called wet bulb temperatures are very, very dangerous and incompatible with survival for more than a few hours. And this has been achieved at least nine occasions since 2005. Our planet is warming. And when there's a very hot day, when there is a, um, a heat index is elevated, our body changes, our circulation changes. Our circulation uh, changes so that we uh, sweat more, so that we um, uh, bring our, our circulation to the surface of the, of the body. And what uh, we get into medical problems when our central pressure uh, is diminished, our circulation collapses, cells become damaged, and we experience a, uh, a cascade of inflammation that can threaten our survival unless there is rapid cooling, uh, rapid hydration, and restoration of blood pressure. The health impacts of climate change involves more than just heat stroke. It involves diverse type of activities. Climate change, increasing CO2, the temperature increases, uh, the seasonal uh, changes, uh, the sea level rises, impacts our health and well-being in multiple ways. Lost productivity, inability to produce food, there's more food insecurity in parts of the world. Um, increased particulate matter. I showed you that slide from San Francisco. That directly affects airway function and cardiovascular health. And, uh, and individuals have uh, increasing rates of illness and occasional death from cardiovascular disease. Um, the stress of, of our changing climate, the psychological and mental health impacts. Um, climate change affects every aspect of our lives and our well-being. Some of the health impacts are on this slide. Heat stress, psychological stress, food availability, with stress, we stop eating the proper amounts of foods. Metabolic syndrome, such as obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. With catastrophic events, we're vulnerable to trauma. Stress and crowding in healthcare, crowded emergency rooms, crowded hospitals, supply chain problems sound unfortunately familiar, available of different medicines and different therapeutics, and new and emerging infectious diseases are possibilities. Clinical climatology 
is a term that encompasses the pervasive and extensive health impacts of this changing climate on all of us. Uh, most clinical specialties in medicine are impacted. We strive to understand the relationship of our cells with each other, with our environment, with the ecology, with the impact on human health. Clinical climatology tries as a concept, tries to integrate all these forces affecting the human experience so that we can understand, so that we can take action, so we can support ourselves and support each other through this challenging time. Look at what happens with extreme heat. Kidneys become affected, heat stroke like we talked about, pregnancy outcomes are, are impacted. One is uh, not able to sleep when the uh, temperature is very uh, elevated. The stress, the mental health issues, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, trauma, accidents, injuries, the decreased ability to be productive in extreme, in extreme heat, and the uh, very hot days, the increasing um, uh, heat vulnerability is trending upwards over the last couple of years and is impacting all of us. With extreme weather, we experience trauma. We experience stress. Heavy rainfall, these flooding, increases the frequency of certain waterborne illnesses. Waters get into our homes, mold and damage occurs. In dry conditions, we see different types of dust storms relating to, uh, liberating toxins in the air and certain fungal infections. And the climate impacts not only the ecology around us, but also the ecology inside of us. And the bacteria and the organisms that live inside of us that we know are important to maintain our health, the microbiome is impacted and uh, changes our health and well-being. We have an increasing uh, climate. The climate impacts the availability of foods, healthy foods, um, uh, and our changing diet uh, impacts again on our gut microbiome in a kind of a cycle. Um, the different uh, medical specialties are almost all impacted by clinical climatology. So the allergists are dealing with different types of, of toxins, different types of pollen, growing seasons are changing. Dermatologists are, are looking at um, uh, skin rashes and skin infections. Emergency medicine physicians are dealing with disaster events, trauma, acute illness, heat illness. Family medicine and internal medicine are dealing with stress, with mental health, and with metabolic syndrome. Um, OBGYN OB are, are dealing with fertility issues and trying to support uh, good pregnancy outcomes. Pediatrics, children have increased vulnerability to heat stress, increased alert allergies to uh, different substances, uh, increasing frequency of asthma. Uh, psychiatrists are dealing with the mental health impacts that impact all of us uh, because of social disruption, because of civil conflict, because of the world that's changing around us. Climate change is changing the different types of infections that we're becoming vulnerable to. Um, uh, infections are, are uh, impacted because our, we're impacted. The different, uh, uh, our, we are the host for different infections. Uh, there are social factors. Uh, uh, different pathogens are evolving and our exposures are becoming different. Mosquitoes and ticks are expanding their range and their population. The water is warmer and becoming more hospitable to pathogens that can be dangerous to us. Our food and our air have the vulnerability of giving us infectious threats. And scientists list the following infections as being particularly problematic. Malaria, dengue, Zika, cholera, uh, cryptosporidiosis, which causes uh, diarrhea, 
um, non-cholera vibrio, which calls, causes skin and soft tissue infection, Campylobacter, leptospirosis, algal blooms, chick chikungunya, Rift Valley fever, Lyme disease, West Nile fever, and think about not just the, these uh, different pathogens, but when you think about the uh, vectors that bring these pathogens to us, there are all these different types of mosquitoes, the Anopheles mosquito, the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopticus mosquito, that, uh, uh, and as these mosquito ranges expand in a warming world that's more hospitable for vectors and less hospitable for us, we see increasing frequencies of dengue, of Zika, of cholera, of different types of infections. The warm water um, supports different types of algae blooms. The, the warm temperatures allow expanding tick populations, increasing Lyme disease. We are in a changing world. Malaria is a frequent um, infection. Uh, and for in 2020, we've seen increasing uh, uh, cases of malaria to 241 million cases. Malaria had been declining for decades, and now we see increasing frequency, and we see different parts of the world become impacted. Um, we think about how malaria affects the human body, but it's the mosquitoes that are expanding that are bringing this more frequently to us. In Europe, over the next couple of, of uh, decades, it's projected that parts of Europe will have much heavier populations of mosquitoes. Um, dengue fever right now is affecting 360 million people throughout the world. And as the mosquito that supports dengue fever and some of the other pathogens expands, this is going to be an increased uh, frequency. Zika uh, infection, this uh, virus that causes mild flu-like illness in us, but a pregnant woman who has Zika, her child is vulnerable to this horrible, nightmare Zika syndrome where the brain doesn't develop normally. Uh, chikungunya, this uh, viral infection that can give this long-lasting, painful uh, arthritis to individuals, these uh, infections may be expanding the expanding uh, range of mosquitoes in Europe and the current range of mosquitoes in the United States touching our area here in New York and over the next couple of decades, this may expand even further. These exotic infections that we think of as occurring somewhere else may occur in our own backyard as well. These are the players that we need to look out for the Aedes aegypti uh, mosquito on the top, the Aedes albopticus, the tiger Asia mosquito on the bottom. The bottom one is more aggressive biter, it bites during the day, and its, its range is expanding. Um, mosquitoes can make, uh, uh, female mosquitoes lay 100 to 200 eggs per day every three days. One female mosquito can uh, give rise to a thousand offspring in appropriate conditions. Um, I mentioned that cholera is one of the infections. Uh, it causes a dehydrating, life-threatening type of diarrhea that's present. And the areas of the world that may be expanding in cholera as our environment warms uh, is increasing um, over the next couple of years. Cryptosporidiosis, a, uh, a waterborne infection that causes severe diarrhea, has been increasing somewhat over the last couple of years. And when we see uh, outbreaks, uh, as on the bottom graph, it tends to occur during the warm summer months. As there's more warming, there may be more vulnerability. These, um, uh, there are different types of infections. These Vibrio outbreaks are likely to increase as well. And harmful algal blooms uh, are increasing because of the warm temperatures, the warm waters. These algal blooms uh, elaborate multiple toxins, 
don't go swimming if the water is turning colors like this. Uh, it's harmful, it causes skin problems, uh, breathing problems, and can be dangerous. And the tick population is expanding. And Lyme disease is another concern. Ticks uh, overwinter more effectively when the winter temperatures are not nearly as cold as we're exper experiencing right now. And the reported cases of Lyme disease are expanding over the last couple of decades, partly as a reflection of our climate, being more hospitable to vectors that are bringing infections into us. The trends are projected to be up for many of these different types of infectious threats, and they're uh, new infections. They're new and emerging infections. And as we think about the uh, brand new infections that have occurred over the last couple of decades, HIV and AIDS decades ago, um, uh, uh, hepatitis C, the expanse of West Nile virus that never had been in our, uh, never been in our country previously. Um, different types of infections, including uh, pan-resistant tuberculosis, and of course the coronaviruses, SARS years ago, and now COVID, brand new infections. The world is warmer. The world is more crowded, and we are the major land mammal. And a, a virus, a bacteria, a pathogen that finds its way into the human population can expand over the globe. We crowd together. We have the capability to go anywhere on the planet within 24 hours. Our population, the human population has exploded over the last number of decades, and we have become a, a potential target for new and emerging infections. COVID may not be our final epidemic. So what do we do now? We understand that the climate is changing. We understand that uh, heat itself is dangerous to us. We understand that there are different types of infections uh, and new infections that impact us. What do we do right now? Well, we learn how to deal with the heat. We avoid exposure on those very hot days. If the heat index is approaching 130, if the temperature is high and the humidity is high, then we avoid being outside. We maintain hydration. We wear light, loose clothing. We eat light uh, fruits and vegetables, um, and we keep our skin, uh, a spray bottle is useful, uh, cool compresses to the body. We try to watch out for the very young, for the very old, and for our pets that can't take off their clothes uh, and can't cool down in this circumstance. We be aware, our awareness protects us. What do we do now in this changing environment? Well, physically, we increase our physical resilience, our health conditions. We have to have our health conditions well controlled. Um, we are entering an, an era where we don't know what the weather is going to be uh, over the next day, over the next week. We don't know when the next disaster is going to occur. We need to optimize whatever health conditions we're dealing with. We need to approach our ideal body weight. Exercise impo is important. Healthy diet is important. This was a, um, a slide from a study that looked at uh, porters in the hospital, and 15 minutes of resistance exercise, of doing squats, of, of doing exercises for the upper body, of doing push-ups, of, of a strengthen, strengthening the muscle, improved well-being, improved satisfaction, and decreased pain. Um, and uh, if there is a, some type of emergency or challenge, our muscles being strong and protecting us is going to be a part of that physical resilience. And we need to make sure that the food that we eat, 
looks more like this than like a cheeseburger. Fiber is a amazing medicine and fiber helps stimulate our healthy bacteria. Our healthy bacteria stimulates our immune system. Our immune system is vigorous and strong and there's interesting studies that a high fiber diet can improve the resilience against uh, viral infections such as the influenza and in this slide uh, such as COVID itself. Having fiber as part of our diet, eating healthy improves different aspects of our health including our immune vigor against the new infections that we might encounter. What do we do now in this time of unpredictability where there might be trauma that affects ourselves, affects people that we care about, and, and uh, in countries uh, around the world that we are intimately connected with? We need to focus on coping with stress, with unpredictability, with uncertainty. Mindfulness-based stress reduction is an evidence-based approach to be able to impact health and well-being. And in this book by John Kabat-Zinn, Full Cat Catastrophe Living, um, he demonstrates an approach that has been helpful for individuals coping with disability, with chronic pain, with terminal illness. We need to accept be aware, um, and we need a mindful approach to living in this challenging world. What do we do now when things are so unpredictable? Get to know your neighbors. We want to be able to help each other if there's a problem. Go electric, electric vehicle, electric appliances, reduced waste, advocate for the environment. Um, I think it's important to have an appropriate philosophy about how to approach things. Um, we want to control mosquitoes. Uh, during the, the warm, um, warm weather months, mosquitoes may be around us and a thimble full of water is capable, a capable environment of, a mos of one mosquito creating a thousand mosquitoes over the course of the week. So it's advisable to use screens on windows and doors, to use air conditioning, to stop mosquitoes from laying eggs by uh, avoiding um, uh, any type of standing water around our environment, any pails that are uh, just outside of our homes that's collecting water to uh, avoid this. Avoiding water holding containers, both indoors and outdoors, makes it a less mosquito friendly environment. And that's important. We have actions that we can take for climate change. Um, to, to think globally and to act locally, I think is, uh, is something that engages us positively in this circumstance to think locally and to act globally um, is, also, is also relevant. So saving energy at home, uh, reducing waste, avoiding uh, uh, certain types of transportation, uh, decreasing our, our meat impact and eating more vegetables, um, uh, throwing away less food, uh, repair and recycling as opposed to buying new things. Uh, advocating for um, more renewable energy uh, and decreasing uh, um, the energy waste with transportation and with our own personal vehicles. To have, uh, during this time of stress, during this time of challenge, to have a open philosophy about what we're coping with. We are all connected with each other. We are in the same epidemiologic boat. Love your neighbor as yourself. Your neighbor is yourself. Love yourself. The health of the public is the health of individuals. Support public health. Support public health workers. All persons should be cared for. Each person should have health care 
because all of our health is connected. Our individual well-being is dependent on the well-being of all persons, of all living beings. Each of us are important. Each of us are important for our own sake. Each of us are important for the sake of all of us together. This is still a beautiful world. It is wonderful to be alive. There are new things to taste. There are new things to experience. There is love in this world. There is joy in this world. And by working for a world that's safer, by working for a world that, that's better, uh, we can um, enrich our experience right now. We've talked about our changing climate. We talked about the fact that our climate is, is becoming warmer, that our weather is becoming unpredictable. We talked about the impact of heat on our physical persons, on our bodies itself. We talked about different health impacts on, um, on how it affects different conditions and different aspects of our health. We talked about things to do right now. This is a sunrise. Uh, our, uh, our future is before us. I'm so glad for your attention and appreciate uh, you watching today. I hope that you are well. I hope that your health thrives and we're all in this together.